नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भगवदगीता एज इट इज ट्रांसलेशन एंड कॉमेंट्री बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस श्रील ए सी भक्ति वेदांत स्वयं प्रोपाद फाउंडर आचार्य विष्णु चैप्टर 10 टेक्स्ट नंबर 11 भगवदगीता The whole discussion of Bhagavad Gita is Krishna advising Arjuna how to come out of the darkness of ignorance by the previously mentioned processes. But here Krishna gives a different approach to this. That better than control, better than your own efforts to control the mind and senses. If you get my mercy, then I remove your ignorance. Krishna says in the sixth chapter of Gita, Krishna describes in detail the yoga system. by which the yogi withdraws his consciousness from material affairs but at the end of that chapter krishna says that the best yogi is he who is always thinking of me why is that isn't it better just to remove your consciousness from matter krishna gives the clue here that krishna personally removes the ignorance from the heart of someone who is devoted to him krishna becomes personally involved It's very difficult for us to clean the dirt from our hearts. The dirt in our hearts means lust, greed, anger, attachment, desires for sense gratification, varieties of contaminations. So it's very difficult for us to clean these away because these are all lodged there by maya. And maya is very difficult to overcome. That even Krishna himself has. What does Krishna say about this in the Gita? Does anyone know? Daivishya shaguna mai. Daivishya shaguna mai. ट Krishna is speaking to Arjuna. Krishna is a great fighter. Krishna is calls him in Gita, Mahabal. Oh, you with great arms, Parantapa, conqueror of the enemy. But he's not strong enough to conquer over Maya by himself. He can't even conquer his enemies by himself. It was seen after the departure of Krishna that Arjuna, his strength to conquer the enemies was lost. So all energy comes from Krishna. This material energy is much stronger than our energy to overcome it. So if we are told to cross over this material energy, we have to take it. And then it becomes easy to cross over. <coughs> Otherwise, it's very, very difficult. How is it that Krishna helps us? Why should He want to help us? We have been rejecting Krishna for so many lifetimes. We are so insignificant compared to Him. What is the benefit for Krishna? That is simply Krishna's kindness. That He tries to. <coughs> Krishna helps His endeavoring devotee. Here the word is used. Anukampa. This is a word which means compassion, mercy. There are different words in the Sanskrit language <coughs> for mercy. Kripa, Daya, Prasad. That's another word. Maya is also another word. That is one word. Anukampa means mercy. So that's Krishna's mercy. Krishna is offering. I will be merciful to you. To who? As Krishna states in the previous verse. Kisham satta yukta anam bhajita kriti ko ekam. Tadami buddhi yoga kam yena namo priya. To those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, Krishna says, I give them the intelligence by which they can come to me. Or as Prabhupada used to say, if you make one step towards Krishna, Krishna will make a hundred steps towards you. Priti purva kam. To those who are serving Krishna with love, Krishna responds to the, the loving attempt of his devotion. But then, how does he extend his mercy? Krishna says, "I give them the understanding by which they can come to me." In other words, Krishna gives the strength and the intelligence required to help the devotee cross over Maya. 
It's not simply that Krishna waves a magic wand and all of a sudden Maya goes away. Still, we have to make our endeavors to cross over Maya and come to Krishna. But Krishna helps us. Krishna is ever willing to help us. He also wants to see that we are sincere to make our endeavors to serve Him. At the same time, His help is absolutely essential. And the extension of His help to us is simply His wonderful mercy. So this is the special quality of the personal view of God. Generally when people think of God, they think of the supreme power. And they think of God, He's so powerful, He creates this world. But they don't know how powerful He is. He's not simply the creator of some tiny little world, but millions of universes come from His body as He breathes in and breathes out. <coughs> The Supreme Personality of Godhead, not even his original form, but Mahavishnu, who is an expansion of Sankarsha, who is an expansion of Balaram, who is an expansion of the Krishna. <coughs> Krishna's extension, expanded form, from him, millions of universes. And even this material world, it's only a tiny part of the, it's a, in comparison to the spiritual world, it's only a tiny part of the total existence. So how great that God is, people have no idea how great is Krishna. But even his creation of millions of universes, that is not his greatest law. He has unlimited qualities and opulences, and all of them are auspicious for, the, for all living beings. Ananta Kalyana Guna Vishishta. He is decorated with unlimited transcendental auspicious qualities. He is all beautiful. No one can imagine how beautiful he is. Kandarpa Koti Kamaniya Vishishta Shoga. His beauty is such that he attracts millions of cupids. Cupid is he who, uh, he by his shooting his flower arrows, he, uh, expands the material, attractive beauty principle by which every living being in this world is eluded. But Krishna defeats Cupid by his, by his own beauty. Krishna overwhelms any beauty that Cupid can produce. Cupid, that, that word must be derived from Latin, but the original is uh, Sanskrit. Kamade, he who increases lust. So Krishna is all beautiful. He is all powerful. He is all opulent. He owns everything. There is no end to the qualities of Krishna. Even Lord Brahma, who is the most intelligent and knowledgeable person in the universe, he concluded that even if you could count all the atoms in the universe, you could not estimate the qualities of Krishna. Because there are many, many more. But among all his qualities, what is the most important? His most important quality is his extension of mercy and importance. This is the most amazing thing about Krishna. It's not so amazing that he can create and destroy millions of universes. To us that is amazing. It's not amazing that he knows everything past, present and future from every angle of vision. It's not so amazing that he's in the heart of every living being and that he's controlling the wanderings of all living beings. These are certainly amazing, inconceivable qualities. But they do not compare to his quality of mercy. This is the most attractive quality of Krishna. Krishna is all attractive. His most attractive quality is his quality of mercy. We know from Bhagavatam that Shukdev Goswami, he was within the womb of his mother. But within, even within his womb, he was a self-realized soul. So he didn't want to come out of the womb. He thought, well, in this womb is, is all blood and mucus and so many horrible things. But at least I can't get in my head. At least if I stay here, I can just meditate. If I come out of the womb, my mother and father will be so nice to me, and they'll say, goo goo ga ga. <laughs> now get in Maya. So by his own mystic potency, he decided to remain within the womb. So after, uh, after about 12 years, we asked the uh, observe what to do. I'm writing all these books, but my, my wife's been pregnant for So that's 12 years. So he wondered what to do. So 
So he thought, let's call Krishna. If you have any problems, call Krishna. So then Krishna spoke to Yasa's mother, to the, to the child within the womb of Yasa's He said, uh, do you think he could come out of that? He said, no. Too much Maya out there. See, and they didn't even have TV in those days. That's what he called a staunch Brahmacharya. He really wanted to avoid Maya. So Krishna said, well, if, if I give a blessing that uh, I promise that you won't get in Maya, will you come out? So Shri said, okay. So he came out. But still he wasn't very impressed. And when I came out, and you know, it's just what I thought. It's all this family business. And so it's not in Maya, good. but you know, what's the use of hanging around here? So he was already fully developed and grown up. So he started leaving home. So the Asadeh wanted to bring him back because he thought, as a father, it's my duty. I have to give him the Upanayan on some sky. I have to initiate. I have to see that he's initiated as a Brahmana. He has to study the Vedas. So how am I going to bring him back? He's already a self-realized soul. He's not even interested in the Vedic social duties. So what do you do to attract a self-realized soul? You have to tell him something about Krishna. That's later on, uh, Sutta Goswami was asked by the sages of Naimisharanya, why Shukadev, he was already self-realized, so why did he undertake the trouble to study such a vast literature of Srimad Bhagavatam? He's already self-realized in 18,000 verses. Why should he bother reading it? So what's the answer? One of the answers is one of the most important statements. You can say what the answer is one of the most important statements in the Shukadev. Even the self-realized souls, even those who are satisfied within themselves, they become attracted by the qualities of Lord Hari. Therefore, Sri Goswami was attracted to study Srimad Bhagavatam. So Vyasadeh, he had been compiling Srimad Bhagavatam, and he knew that it was pure nectar. It nectar even for the self-realized souls. So to attract Sri Goswami to come back home, Vyasadeh had some of his disciples recite Srimad Bhagavatam on the road on the path where Sri was passing. So as Shukadev was going on the road through the forest, he heard these verses, and the verses describing the qualities of Lord Hari. As he was walking, he was listening. When he heard the fourth verse, he changed his mind. He thought, I'm, self, I'm satisfied in myself, but still I want to know more. What is this scripture you were reciting? And then he saw who was reciting his disciples of his father. So how have you learned this scripture? And obviously they learned it from their guru, from their father. Shukadev's father. So Shukadev understood everything. That my father wants me to come. Shukadev wasn't interested in in the formalities of social life, but he was interested in hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Therefore, he went back to his home and heard Srimad Bhagavatam from his father. Same thing. Bhakti Stanso Svetako never thought of Bhakti Svetako as his father in a material way. He always saw him as a great guru and acharya. So anyway, what what was the content of those verses that inspired Shukadev to give up his determination to renounce his home. Vyasadev had selected certain verses describing the qualities of Lord Hari. Part of the verses that was recited particularly attracted Shukadev's attraction and his attention. That is a verse from the third canto of Bhagavatam in which uh, Vidura is glorifying the qualities of Lord Sri Krishna. He was hearing the qualities of Krishna, the pastimes of Krishna from Maitreya Muni. When he he heard that when Krishna killed Putana, Rakshasi, Putana, that after killing her, he gave her the same position as his own mother. Now, Putana was a Rakshasi, a very nasty. She took pleasure in sucking the blood of young children. This is very nasty. So when you see a young child, you think, oh nice. And you want to pat them, give them some sweets. Sweet, sweet. Yeah, any young children. Young children are the natural object of affection. 
So when Putana saw young children, she also thought, how nice, nice fresh children. Those are actions, full of all demoniac qualities. She performed so many simple activities, killing so many children. Actually, in her previous life, she was the sister of Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj, he was born in a family of demons. He was personally not a demon, but everyone else in his family, except his grandfather, Prahlad, they were all demons. They were all descendants of Hiranyakashi. So Bali Maharaj had a lot of association with Prahlad, so he was a great devotee. But all the other members of the family, they were just normal demons. Nasty, mean, demoniac. So Bali Maharaj's sister, her name was Ratnamala. So when Vamandev first came into the sacrificial arena of Vamandev, everyone appreciated what a beautiful young woman. So even Bali, even Bali Maharaj's sister, oh, what a nice young woman. I would like to have a beautiful young child like that. But who is his fortunate mother? I would like to have a child like that and feed the milk from my breasts. A motherly feeling to her about See, even among the demoniac people, they, they give pain and trouble to each other and to others. But even their own children, they have loving feelings towards. So she was thinking like that. But later when Baman Dev showed his true colors and cheated Bali Maharaj and took away all the opulence of the demons, then Ratnamala thought, I'd like to kill her. That's what she thought. So in the next life she got the chance to try to kill her. No one can kill her. And bringing her demoniac nature, she killed so many children. But when Krishna sucked out her life air, he removed, by, by, by doing that, he nullified all her offenses. And he remembered that in a previous life, she also wanted to treat me just like my mother. So, all right, now you be my mother. Your offenses are all vanquished. Now you get the same position as my mother. You may think, well, how could she become his mother? Is there only have one mother? And even if you think there are so many incarnations, but they only have one mother each. Although Krishna had Devaki as one mother and Yashoda as another, but that's only two. So how can you how can you become situated in this uh, ras of treating the Lord as her child? That's all your ras. So you see, there were unlimited cows. Sorry, unlimited yeah, unlimited cows and unlimited cowherd families in Vrindavan. So when Brahma stole all the cows and calves, then Krishna expanded himself as all the uh, as all the cowherd boys and calves. When, when Brahma stole all the cowherd boys and calves, because all the cowherd men and women who are the same age as Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda, they all desired. Actually, we would like Krishna as our son also. In Vrindavan, all the cowherd men and women. They all love Krishna even more than their own children. So when Krishna came and stole their butter, actually they pretended to be young, actually they were very pleased. But they were thinking, actually we'd like to have Krishna in our home and regularly feed him and bathe him and clothe him. So when Krishna expanded himself in the form of all the cowherd boys, all the gopis and gopas, they got that opportunity. And all the cows also got that opportunity because they had Krishna as their calves. So Krishna is very merciful to his devotees. And he's even merciful to someone who has a tiny inclination to serve him. So Vidura was astonished that see the mercy of Krishna, that this uh, this Rakshasi, she deserved to be thrown in hell forever by the Christians. Yeah. According to the Christian theology, God is so kind and merciful and loving that if you make the mistake in one lifetime and don't believe in Jesus and eat beef like a good Christian, then you go to hell forever. But here we have the real understanding that if there is a little inclination to serve him, he will overlook so many offenses and give you that opportunity. So this is the most attractive quality of our Krishna. How merciful he is, how kind he is, how much anxious he is to take us back to him. He is far more anxious to take us back to God here than we are to go. You see, we are chanting Hare Krishna. Sometimes we think it's Krishna. Most of the time we think it's Maya. But Krishna is always thinking of us. He doesn't stop thinking of us. He 
gives us the intelligence for which we can do this. So, he's trying to wake us up. He comes personally and speaks by the Yeah, he doesn't personally need to come to this point. Even one of his devotees can deliver millions of universes. Still, he's so kind, he comes, speaks Bhagavad Gita. He comes in so many incarnations to deliver us. Even in this most sinful Kali Yuga, he comes and says, All right, you can't do yoga? Never mind. You're not interested in yajyas? All right, even though my name, Krishna, his name is Yajya Prit, he's very fond of yajyas. All right, never mind. You can't follow all the Vedic rules and regulations? Never mind. Just perform this yajya, Sankirtan yajya. Just chant Hare Krishna. Can't do anything else? Completely useless in all respects. Just open your mouth and say, Hare Krishna. <laughs> if you can't do that, still leave your mouth open and we'll put some prasad in it. He's so merciful. He's trying in all ways to deliver. And we are saying, no. Krishna is trying to wake us up. Sometimes you make a little effort. Okay, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. That's enough for now. Okay, I chatted Hare Krishna enough for today. Now, now for Maya. Now let me enjoy life. We're such fools and rascals. Maybe that's why the Christians have the idea God sends us to hell forever. Practically we deserve it. But Krishna is so merciful. If we see little inclination to serve, he accepts it. But we shouldn't take that mercy very cheaply. We shouldn't think, well, I can smoke cigarettes and then I can chant Hare Krishna. Krishna is very merciful. Let me enjoy life now and when I'm 97 years old, I'll chant Hare Krishna. Krishna is very merciful. Don't uh, try to cheat Krishna. Krishna is very merciful. But he's not a fool. Krishna says here, Preeti Purvakam, those who worship me with love, to them I extend my mercy. So we have to have some love for Krishna. We have so much love for Maya. So somewhere in our hearts we have to push Maya away and call out for Krishna. Krishna is prepared to be merciful. We have to show some sincerity. Then Krishna will extend his overwhelming mercy. So let us do our part. Be very sincere devotees of Krishna. Pray for his mercy. How do we pray for his mercy? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. In Russia, there was famous at one time. There was someone who used to go here and there just praying. What is that? Jesus have mercy. You know about that? It's famous outside Russia. <laughs> it's supposed to be famous in Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, in Russian, uh, it is literally it sounds like this. Uh, oh Lord, be merciful. Oh Lord, be merciful. Lord, be merciful. Lord, be merciful. They say it's like a mantra. In Russian, Orthodox. Kyrie Yahweh. It's in Latin. Lord have mercy. And in Sanskrit, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any questions? How a devotee exactly uh, overcomes Maya? Is it that Krishna gives him power, or is it he? Uh, is it that he orders Maya not to uh, overcome? Yeah, when we are when we are sincere, then Krishna helps us. We're totally dependent on Krishna's mercy, but at the same time we have to take that mercy. It's just like if we've fallen in a deep well, how can we come out? It's only possible if someone gives the mercy by sending down a long, strong rope. But then we have to take that rope and continue holding on to it while they pull us up. So if we're halfway up and then we think, oh, it's very tiring holding on to this rope. You know, why should I have to hold on to this stupid rope? Why don't they say, hey, you up there, you should find some better method of pulling me up. Why should I hold on to this rope? To hell with this rope. Okay, let it go. So we have to keep on holding on to Krishna. What does it mean to stop, uh, to serve the devotees and which devotees should I serve? What does it mean to serve the devotees? Well, there's all kinds of things. Just like distributing prasad to the devotees, cooperating with all the devotees in all the different services, complete distribution, organizing festivals. We serve all the devotees. If we're serving prasad and we don't say, hey, you're not very advanced, I'm not going to serve you. Serve all the devotees. <laughs> is it my fault that I can see faults in others? Or uh, is it uh, the real, real situation that these faults in others do exist? They may exist. Everyone in this material world has some faults. But it's our fault if we dwell on their faults. Rather, we should try to see the good qualities in relations. It's understood that everyone in this material world has faults. Which, if they're chanting Hare Krishna, then, oh, well, that's far more important than millions of faults. From what might be called a practical point of view, we, we may be aware of different people's idiosyncrasies. We may be aware of different people's idiosyncrasies. Idiosyncrasy, you know what that means? 
Idiosyncrasy means uh, personal characteristics. Often it means not very desirable personal characteristics. Yeah, from a practical point of view, if for instance we know that someone has a tendency to be irritable, even though they're a devotee, then we may behave with them in such a way that they are less likely to become irritable. So that is practical. Well, at the same time, it's you know, we should see, is it, is it our service to find all the faults of everybody else? What does fault mean? Fault means um, some improper behavior, the improper start. attitude. That is produced by <coughs> lower consciousness or undeveloped consciousness or lack of developed consciousness. So really, um, if we're to help others to come to a higher standard, we ourselves have to be on a higher platform of consciousness. Then we can raise, we can help others to come to a higher level of consciousness by which those faults will be overcome. Otherwise, if we simply see others' faults, then that may be a manifestation of our own lower consciousness. Unless we're on a higher level of consciousness, we don't have the means to, to help others come up. It's really why the most important thing for us is to raise our own consciousness. And if we do that, then automatically others around us will come up to a higher level of consciousness. If they're blissful, enthusiastic, always ready to serve, happy to chant the holy names, then others will also pick up on that. There's a saying in English, example is better than precept. You say that in Russian? Better than just telling someone, hey, you're in mind, is ourselves to not be in mind. And uh, the happiness that comes from being Krishna conscious will inspire others also to be even if faults are there, that's understood. You shouldn't dwell on the faults of others. That is not Krishna consciousness. Do you know that story of the Brahmana and the prostitute? That's in one of the small books, isn't it? Which book is that in? Can anyone remember which book that's in? No, 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 no. Now, what this story is, there was a Brahmana living close to a prostitute. And the Brahmana very properly followed all the religious principles. And he used to berate the prostitute. Berate? Means chide, oh, yes. chastise, yes. criticize. You are such a mess. She used to think it's true. I'm such a mess. Somehow so I got in this position. I don't know how. I don't know how I came to be like this. I'm very now that Brahmana, he's worshipping Vishnu. He's such a pious soul. I wish that I could worship Vishnu. So she was thinking like that. Brahmana was keeping a watch on her home. And every time she got a customer, he'd throw a rock. And gradually a pile of rocks filled up. And every time he saw her, he would look at the pile of rocks and look at her. <laughs> so what happened when the Brahmana died, where did he go? He got born in the womb of the prostitute. And the prostitute was always thinking that Brahmana is such a great devotee of Lord Vishnu, I wish I could serve Vishnu. So in the next life she got the chance to serve Lord Vishnu. Well, so we're not recommending that you uh, <coughs> take up simple activities. But the point is that we should not make a profession at all. It's not healthy for Krishna consciousness. And, you know, when someone is always criticizing others, I know that, and this man that, and did you hear about that, you know this, <coughs> and this guy's not good, Oh, and it's good, good, just like, just like vomiting. <laughs> Let it glorify Krishna. What is sincerity? What, what is it to be sincere? Sincerity means the desire to serve Krishna without any personal motive. Some quote from my Brahmacharya book? No. Okay. Because sometimes uh, people tell me, I read in your Brahmacharya book in mm. Russia, and I say, well, I, I didn't write that. She asks whether a child can wear a uh, supple sporty linen at all, a small child. A small child? Well, you know, it's like kind of decoration. The old Brahmacharya means to live in the Guru Guru, to live in the ashram of the Guru Guru. You can do a few minutes. If a devotee is very inimical you know, to materialistic people, how can we help him to get rid of his attitude? Well, improvement comes by preaching. That's one kind of envy, actually. Krishna speaks in the Bhagavad Gita about the devotee who is very dear to him in chapter 12. That, uh, 
Nirma Mala Nira Ankara. So the first two lines describe the, the attitude of the devotee towards Sarva Bhutana, all people, all living beings, not only humans, that he is Advaita, he is, he is not inimical towards any living being. He's a friend to all and merciful to all. So, in our preaching, yes, we use strong terms. Prabhupada used strong terms. Prabhupada used very strong terms to describe non devotees, those who are against the sense of Words like rascals, fools, nonsense, animals, cats, dogs. These are all words that Prabhupada regularly used. But you see that uh, in his personal dealings, Prabhupada is very considerate. And sometimes Prabhupada would be very strong, even with non devotees, just to bring them to a higher point of consciousness. Even with devotees. With devotees, with non devotees also. I can't imagine how strong Prabhupada was. Many times when your own disciples they were just absolutely shaken by him. Once, once Prabhupada came to a place and they cleaned up after taking prasad and all the prasad was dried up and stuck to the floor. Prabhupada was so angry. He came here as brahmanas, but he just lectures. He went on and on. So one devotee got out his penknife and started scraping up the thing floor. Prabhupada looked at him disgustedly and said, why don't you use it to cut your throat? There's another time one devotee, girl devotee, she was always touching everything with her feet. And Prabhupada was always chastising her, don't touch things with your feet. So one time she said, Prabhupada, I might as well just cut my feet off things. Yes. Prabhupada was extremely angry. One time one devotee said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I'm the most fallen. Prabhupada looked at him and said, you're not the most angry. <laughs> you are simply, you are simply <laughs> insignificant. So Prabhupada was very strong. At the same time, he was very loving and kind. He was strong, but he wasn't sentimental. And he knew how to lift people up. He pointed out that material life is no better than animal life. There's the same. Yeah, he pointed out that yeah, human life without Krishna consciousness well, is just animal. Life. Yeah, because we said that human life is like animal life. But at the same time, he was able to lift others up out of them. So, if someone's not able to lift others up, then he should maybe be a little cautious in his condemnation. <laughs> in the science of self-realization, there's one, you see there's one section, there's a letter from one lady called Lynn Ludwig, in which she writes to Prabhupada, and she says that, I met some of your followers, and they're very negative towards materialistic people, and don't you think you should teach them? She was respectful, but she said, I think it would be more befitting if they were more loving. So Prabhupada gave quite a lengthy and very nice reply. Prabhupada said, yes, it's very nice to talk about love. The actual fact is that this, I can't remember exactly the language Prabhupada used, but he said the actual fact is that this material world is miserable. There is nothing good about it. So Prabhupada said that especially those who are new in Krishna consciousness, they're trying to protect themselves from Maya, so it's not surprising if they become, if they're apparently imbalanced in that way in, in apparent negativity. But at the same time, he wrote to her that they have dedicated their lives to Krishna. So that is glorious. Prabhupada is hinting that you're not really in a position to criticize them. Some uh, strong dislike of material life can be quite helpful. That may, in, in the course of time, the devotee may become more mature and see everything in perspective and see how to deal with different people. And as his Krishna consciousness develops, that seeing every person as more and more as part and parcel of Krishna, someone to be preached to, we should caution the devotees not to. It's, it's very easy to disturb people and turn them away from Krishna consciousness. So it's a great art to preach strongly, but right. in a way that others will be lifted up. Generally, your devotees are not very expert in that. And your devotees are not very expert in anything. But it's, at the same time, it's, it's good to maintain some discrimination that actually materialistic life is nonsense. If we, if we think that, you know, well, it's all very nice, and everything's nice, and everything's good, and that's, that's not. The actual fact is that materialistic people are all nonsense. That doesn't mean that we should hate them, nor should we think that we ourselves are very advanced devotees. Rather, we should think that by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, I've got the chance to understand that this is all nonsense and become purified. 
and uh, I got the chance to try to give that opportunity to others also. If anyone has to go, make sure they get some prasad. Do you have prasad for them? Were you distribute? Did you distribute the books? Uh, for how long? When? I'm where? still distributing books. Right, Yagi Priya? I'm planning to distribute some books today to you, all of you. you see, what Don't run away. Can you uh, dwell, dwell on how you distribute the books? Can you tell some stories? I'll show you a story. In fact, we can do it right now. Why not? She was the she drunk. Anything auspicious should be done immediately. Okay, bring me the box. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'll bring the box. Where's the box? Material life is nonsense, but if everyone understands it at once, so it doesn't mean that there will be no material world anymore? Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and we can all chant Hare Krishna and go back to Nagar. No more need for factories. Only dancing and singing with Krishna. I saw here in Lipitz some big factories are closed down, huh? so people must be very sad. We have something, if you don't, if you're not working in the factory, then you have time to read Prabhupada's books. Now this book, you see. Further <laughs> <laughs> questions or life comes from here? Further questions. This one is a serious book. This is the this is the first book that I read. Which one? Krishna book. I was absolutely bewildered, absolutely in Maya. I'm doing a little better now, I hope. I pray for His mercy. This book saved my life. Does everyone have this book in their home? Krishna Lila, Krishna book? Do you have this? This is a special mercy for the Russian people. That Krishna has arranged that you have a very long, cold, dark winter. So you can sit at home with these books and read them. And be in ecstasy. All you need is love. Krishna. So we would like to request everyone to make your home Krishna conscious fully. Fill up your shelves with Prabhupada's books. By reading these books, you become Krishna conscious. And when you become Krishna conscious, then you become happy by understanding Krishna. What could be better than that? Therefore, Prabhupada said, he requested all his disciples, please distribute my books by which people can get knowledge of Krishna. And if you distribute these books, you also become happy. Because Prabhupada becomes happy and Krishna becomes happy. And when I distribute these books, I also become happy. So I'm going to ask everyone here to do something to make me happy. And I've come to your town, so you please do something to make me happy. And you'll also become happy. All you have to do is empty the money out of your pockets and fill them with Prabhupada's books. The money comes and money goes, but the book stays in your house. That is your eternal benefit. How much is this book? So How much is this book? For 40 rubles. See, now 40 rubles people spend and it's gone. Yeah. What do people buy? They buy vegetables, clothes, soap, different things. Maybe some video. If you buy this book about Krishna, you can read it again and again. I've read this book many times. I don't even know how many times I've read it. I didn't keep account. Every time I read it, it's like nectar. Like more and more nectar. So anyway, let's get practical. Uh, we have so many nice books here. Nectar. Nectar of devotion. Prabhupada. Story of Prabhupada. Do you like stories? He had the most extraordinary story of the 20th century. How an old man from India changed the religious history of the world. Single-handed. But the culture of the Western countries is meat-eating, gambling, illicit sex, and intoxication. So how Prabhupada brought hope into the life of millions of people is described in this. So we have many books we want everyone to take. This is 40 rubles. This is only how many rubles? 30. This is only 30 rubles. This is Bhagavad Gita. If you don't have Bhagavad Gita, you must, must, must take this book. How much is this? 40. And if you do have it, you should also take it and give it, yeah. give it to your friend. If you really want to be a friend of someone, give them Prabhupada's book. This is Prabhupada's book. How much is this? 30. And... Perfect questions they want to buy. How much is this one? Six rubles. I will sign it also. Okay.
<laughs> <laughs> not going to go on your score. Should be my score. <laughs>